Tom Shipley. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, man. It's awesome to see you always, but I'm glad to finally sit down and get some time to uh, talk life and shop. By the way, it's a blast being here. Always spending time with you is something special. I appreciate that, man. Well, we uh, we get to do a variety of odd things, and one of them, including <laughs> – that sounded strange uh, – including uh, athletic endeavors, um, social endeavors, and you've got a, a new business project that we'll talk about in a minute uh, that I'm participating in that's also super exciting and fun. Um, but for a little background um, – I met you through War Room years ago, but the last year or so we've gotten closer. And you're, one of the ways that I met you was um, Perry Belcher. Uh, at some point I was talking, I can't remember if it was just us or you were present, but he, oh no, I think you were on stage and he said, oh no, that guy sold more than any of us. He was like, it's not even the same category. And coming from Perry, who has sold quite a bit of stuff online, um, it caught my attention. So. You have gone on to some other projects that I think are impressive right now, but uh, the company that he was referencing at the time was Atlantic Coast Brands. That's correct. Awesome. And that company did $2 billion in, in sales. revenue. Yeah. That is fucking bananas. So give me a little backdrop on that company and how you got into it and maybe how you got out of it if you want to talk about it. Take a step back in... Um 2000, 1999 is when I started my first, I'm going to say my first real business. I was doing, I was a serial entrepreneur for years before that, but my first real business and it was web 1.0. We, it was an omni-channel business. We had, we mailed out millions of catalogs every month. We were, we got up to 14 pages in the Sky Mall magazine for those people that remember Sky Mall. Wow. It was a blast. And when I did some acquisitions, I sold that business off. I was looking for what the next opportunity was. And it took about three years of my wilderness years consulting for the aha moment of why don't I take my playbook for my first business and use direct response marketing, which is great for brand building to build iconic beauty brands. Now, first of all, 2005, we were laughed at. We were told you can never and will never be able to build iconic beauty brands through this less than what was thought of uh, authentic direct response marketing. And I went, unity economics and history says you're going to be wrong. Mm. And I said, I will gladly take on Procter & Gamble, Estee Lauder, L'Oreal head on and watch. And the first year it took us, uh, first year we barely eked out 300,000 in sales with this first product that we developed. We hired a lab, tested it with people we knew, and this first product line of hydroxytone. That second, two, 18 months later, we did 125 million. And over the life of that first brand, we did a billion dollars. Shit, hold on. So there's a, <laughs> I wanna break down a couple <laughs> things. The first was the first venture. Uh, what was that specifically? So you, had, you, you dropped some crazy stats, like 14 pages in Sky Mall. What were you selling? Okay, so that business was a, um, I always looked at for market opportunity or as I look at Blue Ocean. Now, some people say to understand red ocean and blue ocean, and what I love to use the expression of is purple ocean. Mm. So red ocean is those, if I want to get into the toilet paper space and go head to head, again, it's margins are horrible, a lot of competition. It's just very, very rough in a lot of commodity like products. So that's really red ocean. Blue ocean is where no one's doing anything. And so it's really wide open. What I'd like to look for is purple ocean opportunities where um, there is a strong marketplace for something and there's just this lack of solutions and you can pull people open over into this blue ocean opportunity. So I was looking for what are the purple ocean opportunities. So I look for big markets. Can I ask you about that real quick? Just go for it. So uh, to me, what I heard or how I internalized that was um, sort of, you know, the um, the narrative of if you're the first one, you end up with arrows in your back. Yes. So the idea of, for me, when I heard Purple Ocean, I heard wait until there's some established players in the game that have proved concept in the space and maybe taken some of the arrows and then come in. Is that the idea with it or is there another driver for Purple Yes Ocean? and no. Okay. So let me give a case example is uh, 11 years ago, uh, we're always looking for, uh, we were doing a, a portfolio of beauty brands. We're always looking for what is the next big thing. So uh, 11 years ago, an opportunity came up. Well, it was an, you're always looking for what the problem you want to solve. And the problem that I identified is my sister and my mother said that they had hair, hair thinning hair issues. I can and relate. I, 
And <laughs> and I looked at the marketplace and looked at, well, what solutions are there for women? And then the big aha moment is Rogaine has a single, as a men's line, Rogaine has a single SKU for women, and that is women's hair regrowth. There's no one that specializes it. One mm. out of every three women have some type of hair loss. Wow. And so this mass market not being addressed now, everyone knew that hair loss is a big category. Everyone's focusing on men or unisex brands. And I know that if you focus on someone on some things with your own point of view, and you can basically dominate a market, you can be the category king. And that's what we did is so we spent two years with our PhD from Pfizer, developing the first clinically proven system, FDA approved system for women's hair loss. And then we came in and no matter what channel we went into, we won. Why? We were specifically addressing a beauty brand for women that regrows women's hair. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of large marketplace, which was hair loss, taking part of that marketplace, specializing in it. So the demand was there. Women were out using men's products or unisex products, but there was no one that brought a brand. So by us creating a new vehicle and a specialization for a specific solution, we created this category, but it was out of a bigger category. And then we we're able to dominate. So we identified what we created, what I call a purple lotion opportunity. Mm. I love that. That's actually great clarity. So um, it's uh, contrary to my thought of waiting for people to take the arrows and prove concept and actually looking for something that's totally established. Um, totally works. And then looking at a derivative of it where there is total blue ocean, where nobody's actually capitalizing on that solution. 100%. Love it. Super cool. Okay. So um, so that was the first product in that initial company? No, it was not. Okay. That was um, third brand by then. Got it. Got it. Got so, it. So, okay. Um, so initial company, what were you selling? So, and that, and that was called the T-Shipley catalog. I have no idea where I got the name from. <laughs> and so- It's very creative. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> so um, every- what there wasn't, there wasn't one source where every business professional, executive, Wall Street type person can go and source their solutions, whether it was a briefcase, briefcase, portfolio, desk sets, leather, furniture. There wasn't one source. And that's what identified as that blue ocean opportunity back then. People are buying products from everywhere, but there wasn't one source. So we just we were basically said we defined work style for the professional. And that's where we started. We everything from sourcing products to manufacturing own products. And then we had our online store, we had our catalog, and then we were, it was just Sky Mall was just perfect for us. And to to place this, uh, what what year was this? 1999. Cool. So it was web 1.0. So from online perspective Wild. is email was brand new. People oh were saying, God. how do you actually leverage? How do you build a list? How do you convert? Um, Google AdWords was early stages. So it was just such an, you know, people were talking about what this thing is SEO. So it was just such a really exciting period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, okay. So you moved through that and I want to get to um, Atlantic because that's uh, a huge, yes, a uh, huge revenue. Um, what was the, what was the, the book end of that? How did that company, where did that company go? Why did you get out of it? Did you sell it? Did you quit? Did it so, explode? What happened? Well, <laughs> good questions. Um, you know, there's always a question is, is, is the success of a business, how do you measure the success of business? Is what you did along the journey or what the closing chapter was? Mm. That's a really good question. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah. That's and a I great know, question. And I have some businesses that they had ex extremely successful runs and at the end, they just wandered down. Yeah. or they turned over their employees or something. So, but the years between were magic. So we we had a successful exit a year ago, June to private equity. A year ago, June. June is when we oh. sold off that business. Shit, so in 2021? Yes. Okay, so that's existed the entire time. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Interesting. We started 2005 and it was definitely a five-year business and then we were up for another five years and then- Sorry, this is happens. Atlantic you're talking Atlantic about. Atlantic Coast Branch, yeah. Got it, so what happened with the initial one in 99? Okay, so that was that from, I uh, did some acquisitions along the way and I sold that portfolio brands off in 2001. Okay. I stayed on for a year. Oh. And then I left. So quick cycle, so that was a two year. Yeah, 1999 through 2002. Got yep. it. Yeah. Um, uh, why did you sell it? Uh, we needed capital to grow. So mm -hmm. basically we merged our businesses with two other businesses and we got a capital infusion and that was it. And you just, you were ready for a new thing? No, I was ready to scale it to the next level. 
And ultimately, that one didn't turn out to be that exact honeymoon ending than I hoped. Got it. Which was, um, they had a different vision for the business than I did. Mm. And then that's where the golden rule comes in. And they had the he gold. Was, yeah, they had the gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Got it. So you brought partners in for a capital infusion. Then you had uh, and we took two of their businesses. Two of their business we merged into ours. Um, What's funny is it was based out of Orlando, Florida, and they said, "Well, we're up in New Jersey, and our business is up in New Jersey, so we want you to move to New Jersey and run our portfolio of businesses, and we'll merge your business in." And I said, "I will never, ever, ever move to New Jersey." <laughs> And yes, five years later, we moved to New Jersey oh. for a whole new adventure, the business that we actually bought up there. So oh, it's kind of funny. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So close that chapter. Um, what was in Atlantic? That is the era where you did the um, uh, Rogaine for women. So yes. Yeah, so we started with Hydroxetone. That was our first brand. And what is that? And it was it was skincare for women. Got skincare. It. Okay. And it was just a line on fire. You found it in, you know, retailers like... Um, Alta, we were, again, we had a number of retail partners in addition to um, most of our business was online though. Online, but we also did, during the transition of all of our brands, again, the one powerful thing for people to remember is that every offer will eventually die. Every channel will actually become, um, basically its utilization or its effectiveness will go down to where it's not worth focusing on. Mm. So to give you an example, is, and we've always knew that. So we were always testing new channels. So between all of our brands, especially Hydroxetone, at one time we were the, let's see, we were the second largest advertiser in print advertising in the United States, including Pride Magazine. Wow. And at one time, and then you fast forward five years later, we did zero print. One time we were the 15th largest short form TV advertising in the United States. Fast forward five years later, we did zero to short form TV. We were the uh, third largest short form radio advertising in the United States. Fast forward five years later, no radio. Again, even look at our own, online, your online has always been 50% of our sales, but the channels in which it made up change. And one time it was affiliate, then it switched to us buying our own media and it was Facebook. And I guarantee you, I right now I know the amount of Facebook spend is a fraction of what we used to do because you have to be prepared that every channel will die and every offer. That's why you always need to be constantly testing. But that first brand was Hydroxetone. We started some other skincare brands that were purely from an online uh, online perspective. We had a partnership with Christy Brinkley, Christy Brinkley, Christy Brinkley Beauty. Mm. And 11 years ago is when we launched Karanique and Karanique was, became the dominant brand because we were the category king and therefore it was successful in every retailer we put into from Alta to Nordstrom's to um, CVS. And then you'll find it right there. That, but ultimately, you got to be very careful in omni-channel businesses to not let the tail wag the dog. So while retail seems exciting, it's a tough business. It yeah. might give you valuation, but it's one that cannibalizes on where the real money is in direct response. Yeah, And therefore, it turned out to be 10% of our sales. Uh, awesome. Amazon was 15% of our sales at the very end, and the rest of it was all direct response. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and there's probably 17 different paths we could go down there because when you talk about uh, omni-channel, First off, I think most, unless somebody is taking a monster swing, uh, being a billion plus swing, most people uh, don't go omni-channel. Most people figure out a path and this is the way they drive and this is what they're doing. Um, and I love the, uh, the frame of every offer dies. And I think it's such a good lesson to listen to that over the course of, in your case, you. 